Okay, welcome everyone um, to uh, Public Service Leadership COVID-19 Sustainability Stress and Performance Management. Um, I can see here we've got a, a good turnout so far, a um, large number of attendees, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll, give, uh, I'll be giving an introduction for uh, the first five minutes or so, and of course um, I'm sure more of you will be, will be filtering on uh, during that time. So again, we're excited to have all of you here. My name is Amanda Bissell. I'm a CareerJoy's Corporate Success Specialist, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's panel. Um, I'll be introducing our panelists and our host as well in just a moment. But before I begin, I'd just like to set a couple ground rules and introduce you to GoToWebinar's attendee panel so that our session runs smoothly and you're able to interact with it. So to begin, we've muted all of you just to ensure that you can hear our speakers given a large number of attendees today. At the end of the session, we'll be having a question and answer period. If you want to ask a question, please click the raise your hand button and I'll unmute you and invite you to ask your question. You can also type a question or any other important comment in the chat box and we'll respond to those as quickly as possible and we'll respond to the questions at the end. So I'll just give a quick test uh, for those who've joined us here. Um, so do you mind share, uh, hitting the uh, raise your hand button and I'll be able to see uh, that everyone is able to find that on their panel. So I'll give you a moment. Great, lots of uh, hands raising here, awesome. That's really good. Okay, so if you aren't able to find the hand raise button, just type a comment. Um, in the chat box and, and I'll try to maybe troubleshoot that with you um, in the chat privately. During our session today, there will be a number of interactive elements. We'll be running a number of polls and we invite you to engage with us and provide your response. To start off again and, and to test this function again, let's find out uh, what level of leaders are joining us today. So I'll just be running a quick poll here. Great, collecting responses. Okay, so it looks like a large number of you are able to interact with that and, uh, and find that. Perfect, okay, I'm gonna cut that one off a little bit early, um, but it looks like about 43% of you are at the executive level, about 2% at the supervisor level, 28% um, at the manager level, and 28% others. All right. So we have also added a couple of handouts to today's um, seminar panel, um, and you'll be able to download those from the handout section if you would like. The format today will be 40 minutes of panel time and 20 minutes of questions and answers at the end. At the hour mark, we will wrap up formally, and you are welcome to step away um, but we will continue to answer questions for those who remain on the line past the hour. So again, we'll continue to remain on the line past the hour mark, but we'll formally wrap up at that time. So without further ado, uh, let's get to our introductions here. So through their collective experience as senior leaders in public sector organizations, our panelists draw on their own personal experience to help guide you and your teams through this COVID-19 crisis. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Lillian Thompson, who served as the Director General and Dean of the Canadian Foreign Service Institute with Global Affairs Canada, leading the delivery of a range of internationally focused courses, leadership, and professional development. Susan Healy, um, who's joining us here, but is just on audio, is a human resources professional with over 30 years of experience, primarily in the federal public service, including her final role as principal human resources at the Office of the Auditor General. And Margaret spent 35 years in Canada's public service with her final role as Director General with Treasury Board of Canada's Secretariat. And today, facilitated by Alan Kern, head coach and founder of CareerJoy, again, this virtual panel gives you access to uh, practical information, tools, and insight from leaders who have been on the front lines through crisis change and a transformation. So thank you, Alan, as well, for hosting today. 
and I'll uh, pass the time over to you. Well, thank you, everyone. It's good to see such a great turnout for today's uh, leadership class, and um, obviously, and very unusual. And um, you know, if we would have said in January 2020 what was going to happen this year, <laughs> um, I don't think anyone would have been able to predict uh, sort of the the reality of of the situation we're in. And I'm really glad to have uh, our panelists with us and be able to share. And that's what I'm hoping today that you'll have the opportunity of. Um, of uh, listening and obviously today is not about answers it's more about exploring the landscape and giving you some principles and guidance so i'm, I'm really pleased to have the panel we have and thank you Mana, for the introductions so i'll start with um sort of a you know it's interesting uh i was actually educated as an optician so i always say that it's about perspective you know that often you come into your scenario and better worse better worse and that's what we're kind of helping today that we'll be able to kind of give you new lenses or maybe adjust your vision or perspective and that will help you sort of see things uh, uh, more interesting and more clearly and and, uh, and see the potential but also deal with the reality today. So I thought I'll throw it out to the panel. Um, obviously, they, they, in what way is COVID different from other change events, if you want to call that, in the public sector? Obviously, you all three have seen many change events in the public sector in your journey. In what way is this different? What What are the what, what's fundamentally different? What are some of the differences and maybe even some of the similarities that, that you've seen in other events? Okay. Um, well, I'm happy to start. I think the single biggest difference is that this is global. I mean, there have been crises in, in the course of, of my own career. Um, through an accident of timing, I started at Global Affairs on 9-10 as the director of media relations, which is a large operation. And of course, we all know what happened on 9-11. I was literally driving to work when listening to CBC radio when I heard that a plane had crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers. And I assumed, well, it must have been a small plane. Somebody probably had a heart attack, lost control, et cetera. Um, by the time I'd made the 20 minute drive to my Ottawa, to my office at, at 125 Pearson, or Sussex, um, the world had kind of turned upside down. And for the next week or so, I didn't see much of the outside outside world as we went into completely 20, 24 seven, but it was one big crisis. This has affected people professionally and personally. The duration is unknown. Um, the possibility, if you listen to the head of the Center for Disease Control, this morning of a second wave seems to be quite high. So there's no, um, it's a bunch of tunnels with no, no, not even the real beginnings of a clear light at the end. And that's what I'm very conscious of. I do see with people that it's really touched them on so many different levels, personally, professionally, their friends, people, of course, in countries that have also been severely affected by this. So it's the scale is, is I guess, if we had to choose one word, it would be scale. I would uh, I would tend to agree with uh, with that exactly. This is Susan. Um, it, it, the fact that it's global, that's for sure. It's also affecting the public service in a very um, different at different levels. So there's, there are some departments where they would be completely shutting down because their their work is so so related to having the rest of the public service, you know, work with them. Um, in other cases, you've got um, organizations like the CRA who are just all hands on deck and, and going, you know, all out. And I think that was really well phrased in the sense that it is completely global and it is something with no end in sight. And we've seen all kinds of, we've seen tornadoes, we've seen earthquakes, we've seen ice storms, but we've, we've never seen this kind of magnitude. Yeah. I, if I could, I, I would agree. Um, the other piece around this is that there, it, in other crises, there have been sort of segments of the public service that have been really impacted. So you had, you know, disaster relief security organizations where there were swaths of employees who were called up and who were brought into this, or it was management layers, or it was you know, certain groups. This is one of those, as the colleagues have mentioned, it's touching everyone. 
and whether it, it it's touching most people in their work life because if you're not directly there's a lot of departments have a stake in this or or are um, involved maybe not directly but indirectly because we think some are obvious some are not so obvious and they are being impacted by it but there's also as employees Every employee is being touched by this in where they're working, how they're working, um, you know, reporting structures, assignments, a lot of people being moved from this, you know, less uh, important work to something that is related to the to the COVID uh, crisis. So it, there's not a person that hasn't been touched by this across the entire workforce. And I think that goes beyond the public service as well, but certainly true for public servants. And in your in your observation is that we we often talk about IQ and EQ um, as in you know obviously the the is intelligent quotient that the IQ obviously the you know the ability to think and process the EQ the ability to relate and process relationally and and systemically and in a way that uh, has more intuitive parts of it. Um, what this concept of CQ, what we call change intelligence, what, what do you think the impact has been on? Um, on kind of the stressors around change intelligence or upon the individuals within the public sector. What is your thoughts around sort of the implications? So we have IQ plus EQ times CQ. So, the, so that in a sense in that equation, um, what are your thoughts about um, change intelligence in general and the reality of that is, and the impact on individuals within the public sector? Um, well, I think people are still working through it. What I do find is um, people are listening more and being very, very carefully attuned. I find I'm doing this because people I know, whether they were former or professional colleagues or friends or family, it's not always obvious how stressed they are or what part of this has, has hit them. So for example, I have a friend, a former colleague at Global Affairs planning to move um, to the West Coast. Well, she was pretty far along in her plans, and now it's all come to a crashing halt with consequences for stuff she thought she had done, like sold her property here, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm being very attuned both to um, people's tone of voice, looking at emails, um, you know, trying to figure out just what kind of space, and of course that's not consistent one day to another. The other thing I'm finding, and just a very small but very telling anecdote, that people are being very conscious to be kind. I, last week I was coaching a client who sort of said, well, she was her job interview was going ahead and for an EX level position at a department where she had never worked. And um, so we did some prep and then the morning of her interview, I texted her or I emailed her and said, good luck. And she got back to me right away and she said, well, it's not happening until Saturday. And I said, huh, is this happening on sa a Saturday? Public sector interview? And she said, well, she said they phoned her and they asked her about her personal situation, which she hadn't told them about. She's got two children under five and a husband who is an essential worker who is basically going flat out. So they asked her, when's his next day off and would that work better for you? I thought that was enormously kind and considerate. Mm -hmm. And I, that's just one example of behaviors that I've seen that are, are sensitive and really, I mean, even if she doesn't get the job, she's going to have warm feelings towards that particular department and the management in it for the rest of her career. I, I think that's a really good point that we can we can touch people in, in in ways that will reflect our compassion in negatively and positively at this particular juncture for sure. Yeah I, I think too people are, are aware I would agree um, that that um, people are really more conscious of making that effort. I, I am seeing some folks who are, I will say, struggling with it. They're, they know they want to and they should, um, but this whole kind of situation changes, has an impact on how you lead people, right? Because the whole thing has changed. And so people are trying to adjust to that and trying to figure out 
you know, uh, what is the right way to do this now? How do I manage people who I can't see? Um, you know, things like once a week calls is not enough. You know, you've got to call every day kind of thing. And so the, I think some are, they, they are, they definitely know they want to, they have to. Um, and, but some people are still trying to figure out what that looks like day to day. Um, if this had been a crisis that was just a, a short term, you know, some of those disasters, I think about the power outage, you know, in the early 2000s, it, it was three or four days and, and man, we can rally. The public service rallies really well when there's a crisis or short term. This is now becoming a new normal and that presents a whole new challenge for people is kind of like I have to adjust my behavior long term now. So so I can see people are really trying hard to figure out well, what does that look like from day to day for me and my role, my team, the people I report to. As I was thinking that, Margaret, I was thinking about the Prime Minister's role and you talked about going from a once a week uh, mm -hmm. conversation to a daily conversation, including Saturdays and Sundays, right? <laughs> right? Um, what yeah. are your thoughts, uh, as you've seen at the very senior level, uh, some of the good things you've noticed uh, uh, from the Prime Minister and from the senior execs that you've observed, um, and also maybe some things you've observed, observed in the past. I was remember Susan, maybe I'll share about this, about she was um, part uh, as the active shooter, you know, and that, that occurred. We forget about that as a crisis, right? And all the ramifications. So, what are some things that you've noticed, uh, both from the Prime Minister, but also within the public service, both in the current situation, but previously has has really um, shown um, uh, the right kind of leadership at the right time? Um, well, I think the fact that he's out there daily has been a very, very, very good. Good and and the fact that the message it's clearly been very well thought out and that there's something every day. I I remember for example I guess it was about a week ago when he reached out to the children, the kids across Canada. That really touched a lot of that really touched a lot of people. I also think some of the um, the messaging that I've seen about ten days ago the clerk did a message to the public the, the public service in which he said basically it was what you'd expect it was thank everybody for all your hard work but it was also no for those of you who are feeling guilty because you're not needed at the front at the coal face right now don't worry you're going to be back and when you're back there's going to be an awful lot to do so the messaging has become more personalized because a lot, a lot of the time it's kind of you know it almost reads as though it was written by a machine so mm -hmm. the personal the personal touch has been key for me yeah. I would I would also agree with that and and uh, furthermore like there were a couple of really good examples um, when when Trudeau said Canadians come home I heard so many people in social media saying that was what touched them and 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 got them on a plane or got them in their car coming home from wherever they were because it was a simple simple message and then the um, the uh, minister in uh, Nova Scotia he said, I want you to stay the blazes home. And you know what? That resonated and became a t-shirt and went completely viral. Why? Because he was his passion and his and his uh, desire to be straightforward had him using language that really went out and touched people. So that that uh, I think those are really great examples of leadership. Yeah, and on a slightly different level, sort of within the public service and then sort of senior executive levels, what I've, what I've seen and what colleagues have, have relayed as well is that they're getting a lot, a lot of communication, some of it duplicated, um, but I think they, they appreciate the fact, and, and we all know, you know, you need to communicate over and over and over, so better that we hear it several times than that people miss it. So I think there's a real concerted effort to make sure that at every level, people are connecting with everyone. That that outreach has been quite broad. So, so I think that that's a really good uh, a really good thing to see happening. You know, all three of you have seen different events at different times. Not this event, of course, uh, but different events at different times. What have you observed, uh, leaders, uh, you know, doing well within those crisis events, and maybe how it relates to the comments you just said, but maybe some other examples, and maybe another. A question along that is a secondary question. What have you seen them not do well, or what? Are you, where have you seen them stumble? And, and and maybe what has surprised you about that? Probably some of the people you thought were going to really do well, and others that were that didn't that surprised you in their in their ability not to rise to that occasion or step in and step up. I know that's a big question, but. <laughs> well, 
I think Margaret made a good point, and the public, and it's been made in, 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 in the media and by people writing letters, is that the public service is generally very good, be it individual departments, and in this case, it's a collective, in coming together in a crisis. And I think a lot of people in, in you know, outside of the public sector and in, in my circle of friends and <clears throat> acquaintances have been very impressed by professionalism. And I mean, look, look, look at the, um, look at all the memes and, and the t-shirts for the, the um, chief public health officers, not just the, the federal one, but right across, right across the country. And the expertise um, that is, the expertise and the deep knowledge and the professionalism the public sector service have really, really come, come across. And that makes a lot of public servants I know feel really, really, um, proud and, and, and happy to be doing their jobs. I was speaking to somebody who was called in to be on the 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift at Finance Canada. I mean, the standard joke about Finance Canada is basically is that if you're a taxi driver, there's only two times, two occasions a year when it's worth parking outside, and that's just before the budget, which is fact where they were when this broke up, or just before the fiscal update. But now they're working 24-7. This is a, the communications branch getting out all the packages of communications. And, and I think Susan mentioned the the CRA. I mean, I've I've had clients there, and they're like they're just going gangbusters. And some of them are taking the core principles or things they know about, and being asked to transfer them to get the serb out really, really quickly. And of course, there'll be postmortems. Um, to to the sort of I haven't the the challenge in these situations that I mentioned 9/11 before, and that went on for oh that went on at a task force level for five months. Um, and twice a day meetings. People who don't aren't able to, um, let's say, reorganize their life, but manage their stress, manage the pressures. That begins begins to show. So you have to you have to look inside yourself. But most of all, you, you also have to be there very much and visible to your team, and not just your direct reports, but the people that are right out there doing the work on the ground. Those are my also, two. Uh, yeah, I, I was also going to say that it's it's the leaders who who understand the diversity of the reactions out there and the diversity of the situations that their employees are in and can speak to that um, are are going to be the ones who are the most successful. Um, just mm -hmm. just making sure that that uh, that they're acknowledging the different situations that we're all in and the role and 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 communicating the vision of what the organization, because because everyone thinks of the public service as one big you know blob, but in fact the public service has so many different facets and so many different arms and and moving parts that it's, it's those who can then say you know the vision uh, for our organization is the following and allow employees to understand what their role is as we go through this crisis. That's great. I was thinking, Susan, we, we have a poll there. If you want to, uh, we're going to put up a poll where, where different people are at with, you know, because obviously we're talking about leaders, but both leaders and individuals, this is in a way, uh, in a way that is collective, although we may have different levels of responsibility and different levels of, um, of pay scale and different numbers, one, two, three, and minus one, two, three, and all these types of things. But the reality is that leaders and individuals are very human and they go through this. We're going to put up a poll there where you see yourself uh, currently, right now, within this sort of the, this change model, so, and Margaret, you're, or somebody else is just going to share that. So we'll put that poll up. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're putting that poll up, Margaret. What, do you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I, thank you. Um, I I think in past years, what I've observed when we have these kinds of crises is that, uh, given that it's a big operation and there's always new priorities that leaders were sometimes they would plan, we react really well, we deal with the crisis uh, phenomenally well in many cases. Um, it's the follow through sometimes that's been challenging. And so I'm really watching in this case and, and trying to, 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 to see what happens um, where leaders sort of say, yes, deal with the immediate, but we need to not lose sight of what happens over time. And echoing some of the comments of the other panelists is, 
is that every individual, every person is going to process this kind of massive change in a different way. And so the important thing is that you don't lose sight. Some people will be ready to go to the new normal in a few weeks. Some may already be starting to get there. They're anxious, they're eager. There will be a large number of people who are going to really struggle to deal with this. And I think Man, uh, leaders are going to have a real challenge on their hands in making sure that they don't lose sight of that as they go forward while they continue to live to deliver on the priority so you've got a couple of tracks going what complicates this one even more is the fact that you don't have people physically around you so when you have the team and you can have team meetings and you can bring in coffee and you can do those kinds of events uh face to face that brings a, a different element. Now you've got a, 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 an extra challenge when you've got people at a distance and we don't know how long that's going to be going on for. So, so you really have to think through and consider each member of your team and how they're going to, to respond. That's something that wasn't necessarily considered in the past. So hopefully we've learned and, and we'll see something uh, different this time. And I think with the way people are really searching to do the right thing, it, it's looking very positive. It's interesting you're talking about if you look at the, the results of the poll here, uh, 30, uh, 37% impact, 5% heroic, uh, amazingly 18% are in honeymoon, that's a good place to be, <laughs> although yeah. we all know we're not there forever, 10% <laughs> uh, disillusionment and 30% construction. So it's interesting about impact and, and reconstruction is, uh, is the highest amount, right? And in between you see uh, those things. And what's it about... You know, when we look at at, at change, um, we uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Maybe you you've seen this. I'm sure you all have. On on um, we we always think of change as is is as sort of something that happens either to us or upon us. Um, but where is but and often where times are like, well, you got to embrace the new normal. Right? Everyone's talking about the new normal, the new right. Um, but what about the old normal? And what about the loss of that. So we often talk about before, and, and one of the thoughts we we have in our work is that before you can embrace change, you have to also acknowledge and embrace loss appropriately. And, and either being stuck in loss is a challenge because you get stuck there, but but it, but rolling right over it into the new normal, the new reality, how good it's going to be, all those sorts of things that we could find. Where where do these things play into sort of grief and, and the change transition and where what the different cycles that people have acknowledged here? I think a lot of people simply miss the daily rituals, you know, of going to pick up your coffee at morning owl, going in and maybe making passing a joke with somebody, whether it's a commissioner at the front desk or going up the elevator with someone. Um, we are social beings, and a lot of that's been cut off now. We're 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 confined, you know, for the most part at home. Um, and there was a survey this one, I think it was the Royal Bank, of, uh, the Royal Bank did it, that only 19, surprisingly, only 19% of people, once this is over in quotation marks, want to uh, work at home. Um, so the idea that would all sort of be, be contained to our homes. So people are, are, are grieving and, and missing people, I mean, and, and trying to find um, none of the ways that have been found. They're fine, but they're not the same thing. Um, there was a funny piece now in, in because we are tactile that in, in uh, British Columbia, where some of the schools have opened up, the new thing um, to give the, the children some physical contact is toe touching, yeah, and through the shoes, right? So, so it's, <laughs> you can't handshake anymore, but you can toe touch because that's mostly, you know, almost six feet between the two of you. Um, so I think, you know, things will change. One obvious one, for example, is if we're in a series of recurring. Um, pandemics is workplace 2.0 really the model people are beginning yeah, yeah. to um, ask ask some of these these questions um and other just adjusting to working at home i've, I've got a, a member of a group where the uh the male partner had always worked at home his wife all of a sudden had to and she discovered basically he was using the entire house he was pacing about talking into his iphone and and there was no real space for her i mean they had to negotiate you know specific specific rooms so this is kind of a continuous process and i think you know and also an experimental process because i i don't think um it's, it's going to take quite some time and, and there will probably be some backsliding along the way because of circumstances beyond anyone's control. That's funny, I was talking to Susan yesterday and we were talking about her, her children and I was thinking of the stats we're just seeing here about loneliness, the things that people have lost in the work at home center that 
know, the depth of change. Susan, maybe you can share a little bit about your two children are both public servants now and um, well, your, your they're, comments they're, about, yeah. yeah. They're, they're <laughs> not young so adults, I should say. Yeah, exactly, young, exactly. young adults, exactly. Unless but, you have your five and your eight-year-old out there generating <laughs> early income for you. <laughs> so uh, both of my adults, Adult children are working and they're millennials, you know, through and through. And both of them are working from home. And they've both said to me, I never want to work from home again. I guess I'm, they are so looking forward to getting out and back and being with their teams. And I think this has allowed them to see that they, I think they, they thought that working from home would be like a nirvana and it has absolutely not been exactly what they were thinking. And so they now are going to potentially um embrace and see some of the things that they didn't necessarily value in the past so that's really interesting yeah i need to play more nirvana maybe that would be helpful <laughs> <laughs> <Good point. laughs> yeah. margaret any thoughts on that yeah i think i mean it, it's been a it, this is presenting a really nice opportunity well nice it, it's it's presenting an opportunity to almost experiment with things. We don't have a choice, we can try it, but it is giving people um, a little more insight. I, I know organizations that I worked with in the past where managers were saying, you know, work at home, it's not an option, it's only for people who have accommodation issues because if I can't see you, I'm not sure that you're working. So I think this has really gone a long way to prove to many people that it's a very viable solution, not a perfect one. I don't think there is a perfect solution um, because as, as colleagues have said, you know, the social aspect is people are finding that very hard and missing that. But, but it is an interesting opportunity that way. I think the other thing we have to remember as, as you change from what was old and what's new is that I, I worry about the people who um, have a hard time adapting to that change. So they may be a little bit less impacted now, uh, they're working at home, or maybe they're one of those, those people that are on leave sort of thing. So it's, they haven't necessarily really felt how work is different. And that as we bring people back into, or we create that new normal, whatever it is, that we not lose sight of the fact that not everybody will jump onto the new as quickly as others. Um, I had one experience where I was in one organization, there had been a reorganization, uh, a splitting up of old departments and joining and bringing in a new department. And it, it wasn't necessarily communicated or handled the best way. And I had staff that I had had uh, when I joined the organization, people who reported to me who were still carrying a chip on their shoulder for something that had happened 10 years earlier because it was not well done in terms of change management. So we really need to be conscious. I like to I like seeing the signs that we're seeing about, you know, the emotional uh, quotient and, and paying attention to that kind of thing. And hopefully we can really nurture that because that can make or break some people. It, it's going to cause extra stressors. Um, and I think we're also far more conscious now of the mental health impacts because there's been so much discussion about mental health in the workplace the last yeah. few years that managers have become very, very conscious of that. And, and I like to think some of the actions that we're seeing reflect that increased awareness around that so there are people that you really do need to kind of hold up and and help support in a very very visible way through these changes make sure they're being heard they're being engaged and that you support that you're letting go of the old and helping them to to come into the new it's kind of like i'm putting this picture up here of my niece offering the golden uh, water and where has the golden spent all day but in the water and how interested is the golden uh, Lily in water at that moment, right? <laughs> so in yeah. a way, a lot of so you have to be very careful how you present it and what each individual needs, right? To be supported and to be motivated towards towards something, right? So I think it's interesting yeah. we think everyone wants water or everyone wants, you know, there's sort of this to, to Susan's point. Susan, what is your observation around that? Sort of how do you offer or how do you identify and offer what's going to be what's going to help your team and and, and help them in both mental health, but also be more resilient and in change? Um, I think, you know, I look at some of the different techniques that people are using. I've been seeing, uh, you know, on the ground with an organization that I'm working with, um, you know, they, they're they starting to really think outside the box. They're having group coffees, but virtual 
virtually, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and getting everyone together. Um, I'm seeing where they're having a daily touch point and it's every single day. Maybe that's too much. I don't know. But I'm, I, I'm just seeing a lot of innovation and, and one particular group uh, got everybody together. And I thought it was really interesting because they, they said, you know, why don't we spend each day spending a few minutes on two members of the team and just saying what we appreciate what we each appreciate about that person and it was so so positive you know people who hadn't worked at all together or very much and they could spend each you know focusing on just two individuals it took them about 10 days to do it um and just talking about the positive things about that person and i saw a visual change in how people were reacting um, because suddenly it allowed them to come together a little bit more. Yeah, it's interesting in this Gallup poll, employees who strongly agree their supervisor or someone at work cares about them as a person, 48%. And I think it comes to Lily and what you said that, that that person in that interview for a department she's never worked with. Um, and that you said will have a lifetime uh, you know, desire, aspiration, and maybe she'll get it, hopefully she will. <laughs> but if she doesn't, that aspiration of it's, it's really truly about we do our best work with the people that care about us and with us mm -hmm. and ab about the things we care about. So I think it, a lot of times people care about those issues, but if they don't feel cared for. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that comes back to resilience and mental, he mental health and the ability to do that. Now, as we sort of think about, um, you know, 30% of, of our participants that are thinking about reconstruction and and, and as we're starting to, uh, you know, the curve is flattening and we're starting to think about um, moving out of crisis into uh, the, what is going to be something new. And I, I don't even want to call it the new normal, which is called the new, right? Um, what are your thoughts or what are your advice or what's your comments around, um, around this? And one of the comments I saw from Debbie DeVoe, president of the Public Institute of Public Service, saying the silver lining is the realization that Technology is the backbone of the governance. This is not just the back office. So what are your observations as we sort of go forward? Um, what are the skills required? Because sometimes people really thrive in crisis, but, but there's that chasm, chasm to, the, to the, right? So they're doing really, really well. They're, their head's down, they're excited, they're enjoyed. But then we move into, now we have to change. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now there's the reality of this, not just like, like the moving in the honeymoon period that's all yeah i want to get married let's move in together this is so exciting but now we actually have to live together <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. um well I, I think it's i'm finding i mean it's a bit probably still a little bit early but i think people are reflecting i mean i think it was margaret mentioned earlier that and the number of people have basically been thrown into doing completely different jobs, drawing on their existing skill set. Um, there was a very interesting piece in the report on business in the Global Mail yesterday or the day before about a director general and assistant commissioner at the CRA who basically um, had dumped on them the fact that the government wanted the uh, CERB program out within two weeks. And of course, it was a massive technological project and it couldn't go wrong. Um, and it, you know, the, the the morning the system opened up, the first 10,000 Canadians who were in there um, had to be able to access it, and it was extraordinary. And I think it, they pulled it off. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but hmm, I think some people say, well, you know, I did this during the crisis. Now perhaps this leads me to think about doing doing something else. Um, you, you don't really know, but I think a lot of people, of my acquaintance anyway, are, are sort of are, are reflecting a little bit where this might this might take them professionally unless they're you know near near nearing retirement um, or want to retire but i think you know we, there'll be some self-reflection and and it's also going to be a, a slow take up because the public it's not going to be like flipping a switch right when the public service comes back it'll be a, a stamping up some backsliding because of you know a second wave or something a hot spot, and um, there will be there will be you know, the media talk about the post mortem on the performance of the World Health Organization, but there will be post mortems, lessons learned, exercise that will take up a good part of the next 
I would say past you know, December, let's say, and that will allow people to reflect on overall how organizations and how individuals worked, and then it'll move on from there. Building on that, Lillian, I think what's really interesting is that the public service has long never been uh, known to be a, a place of innovation. And I think that we've had to use our innovative um, schemes, our innovative ideas in so many ways, using the tech technology, keeping our teams going, uh, applying new programs. And I think this is going to be really interesting to see if this is something that can go on and we can continue to really grow that innovation um, muscle, if you will. Yeah. I, 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 I think, I think, sorry, go ahead, Mark. And I was going to say, yeah. I think on, along your line, Susan, that even Michael Wernick's talking about that. I, I Like, again, I, I sometimes, again, what I've been speaking to clients about this idea of a V-shaped recovery or a Y-shaped reset, <laughs> right? And a Y-shaped reset is different. A V-shaped recovery assumes that everyone goes down and everyone goes back up, right? A Y-shaped understands that some people stay at the stem and have a hard time getting back up the Y. And I think this is more fundamental. And I think uh, globally, there's going to be a lot of pressure on revenue, on taxation, on lean, right? I mean, the flip side of that is where, where, how will all this be funded? Right now, it's everyone's signing checks all over the place, right? <laughs> um, now the question, I think you, you, Susan, you and I, especially you're, you're formerly with the auditor, I know you know a lot about checks and, and <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Um, Margaret, you're well, going to speak into that. Yeah. Yeah. I've, already ahead, had, yeah. I've already had those comments come to me, you know, how are we going to pay for this? Will this result, you know, these are perhaps the negative people or me, Maybe they're the realistic people. Um, you know, is this going to result a year or two from now in a, you know, massive reorganization or cutting of the public service? You know, I've already heard that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's going too far, but how do you pay for it? Yeah, how do you pay for it? Exactly. Margaret. Yeah. It's a big question. Um, I, I would build a little bit on that whole idea of, you know, that, that typically the, the reputation of the public service is that we don't move super quickly on things, right? It's a big machine. Uh, in a crisis, we can react. So I'd like to think we've sort of learned uh, that this is a good learning opportunity to see how things can be done and sustain it. Um, I think what's going to be key, and if I think about managers in the public service and their teams, is to, for me, the biggest thing in order to maintain that and make sure that we can move forward collectively and into that new whatever it is, um, is to make sure that that leaders are building and keep maintaining and paying attention to the trust relationship between their themselves and their employees and building that sense of team. And that means lots of communications. It means you have to really think about what your role will be going forward as a leader. Um, what is how, how do you stay flexible? Because that's part of this now we're learning. So can we adapt that as we go forward? And I think the key thing is going to be really listening, 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 both to clients and listening to employees, listening to wherever getting those sources and being able to 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 um, to process that and incorporate it. So so that that's kind of where I worry about and going forward and making sure we can maintain that that change and that we don't sort of slide back to the the, the old way of doing things. And I, I couldn't. Uh, uh, yeah. I was thinking when you, it's, you know, in the, the one of my favorite brands in Canada is the running room and the running room never asks somebody to come in and run a marathon and invites them to kind of come in and run a 5k. Mm -hmm. So it runs a 5k event. And so it's just come and run 5k, work with us for the next three months and we'll help you run a 5k. And that is the gateway drug to the marathon. It's there. Let's get you on a 5k. And I think what, if anything, I think I'm bullish about, I am really bullish upon the public sector's ability that it's proven to itself, uh, its ability to run and be innovators. I mean, there's, listen, I think the public sector, a lot of people comment negatively on the, you know, on the, on the public sector, quite frankly, there's a lot of negative commentary on it. But if you look at the education of the public sector, mm -hmm. uh, the, the desires of the public sector, we have an incredible team of people there that generally, a lot of those people care. And a lot of those people are super smart <laughs> right? and super creative. They're, they're not just showing up to the end to run off, you know, to, so I, I'm bullish actually. And I think if anything, maybe this has proven to the, the what are your thoughts about, about proving to itself uh, and re-energizing in a way, uh, which not to say everyone, but re-energizing and, 
and reinventing and uh, reaffirming its own value to itself, not anyone else. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's been, I, I agree with you, Alan. I think it's been an enormously, it's made a lot of people feel that the work really does have value because most people, um, for example, uh, you know, employees at the CRA. I mean, if you go into a, go to an evening, you know, an evening event and say, "I work for the CRA," you're likely to get an earful, right? You know, and, and <laughs> one person I spoke with there said, when he, you know, he, he was at a cottage and he said it, and the first other person looked at him and said, "I'm never going to speak to you again." Um, so, so it, sometimes get a vitriolic, vitriolic rea reaction, but you know, look what's at the forefront of um, delivering what needs to be delivered to Canadians right now. It's the CRA, yeah. much maligned institution, right? Um, so I think, I think there is trust, there is faith, and there is a great deal of quiet, not all, sometimes outspoken gratitude for what's been able to be done in such a limited time and and really really extraordinarily quickly and innovatively because i mean the 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 serb thing you know i gather they make it like, like three clicks and you were in it wasn't you know, sort of endless amount of you know construction they realized that many canadians wouldn't know how to manipulate a portal if they were paid to do so they made it simple but it also made it made it made it secure enough so that it worked for 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 the system so i i think um you know it's it's for people who who want to learn and grow, I think there'll be there'll be a, a future. I think expertise is the other thing that's going to become much more valued, whether it's expertise on climate change, expertise on energy futures. I mean, the public health ex expertise inside agencies like PHAC and Health Canada, um, mm -hmm. and the provincial equivalents across across the country. People realize, to your point, there's some really smart, dedicated people, and I. Rarely, I mean, I found people who, who it's easy to find. I've done it myself. Who don't like their current job, but I've not found anyone who's been. I've not found anyone in the public service who hates the public service. Most people mm -hmm. are quietly proud to be a public servant. You know, just before you go to others' comments about that, uh, we're going to open up in a couple minutes to questions. So there's an opportunity there, uh, and uh, Amanda will be moderating the questions. You can also ask them in French. Um, as well, so um, yeah, the questions. Uh, so just in a couple of minutes, we're going to switch switch to questions. Uh, yeah. So I like your question a lot, Alan. I think um, I hope that I think the strongest leaders and the smartest managers will sit with their employees and say, "What have we learned through all of this?" When when you know when we're when we're able to reflect on, and um, hopefully we'll get through this and maybe the next wave or whatever happens, but say, what are we learning about ourselves and what have we learned and how can we continue to apply it in a positive way? Yeah. I totally agree with colleagues. I think the other thing we need to remember is that um, the public services, um, what has always impressed me is right across the board, no matter what level, what job, is how much people join the public service because they want to serve the public and they really do have the best interests of Canadians at heart and so where you know we sometimes say what's well, a slow institution well we're trying to meet many multiple needs at the same time and that isn't always an easy job so I think that desire is something that we should definitely you know and, and can maximize on and really leverage going forward to say you know how how can we then learn from this as colleagues have said and turn that into even better service for the public while making sure that our our employees are engaged and that they're feeling good through the transition okay. one final question then we're going to open this up for questions and then just a one 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 word answer one line answer uh, what has this taught you what is what has this season taught you personally um it, more listening and patience yeah. with myself and with others. Yeah. I think it's taught me how much I can respect uh, the public service as a whole and, and what we've done. And as a country, like I'm, I'm so proud. I, for me, openness and open-minded and open to learning. I think about, I mean, I'm, as a retiree, I'm kind of going, I'm, I'm learning all this new technology and everything. So I think the, the, that's probably made a huge change for me. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we're going to also open up for questions. 
Um, again, we're going to stay to one, but we're going to go after one for those who want to stay. We recommend some people have to leave a couple of quick things. Uh, I'll pass back to Amanda, but we've got, uh, don't forget about the handouts. Um, for those that do need to leave, there's a number of ways we can support you and your team. Uh, the interesting thing is there actually is um, under Treasury Board has, has said, you know, there are supporting training. Uh, they'd rather be uh, without, outside of the, uh, the VPN, which is all of our trainings outside the VPN. So this is a tremendous time for you to, to be thinking about how to help your team with change and all the different things. We've got a number of ways to help you and your team think through this as an approved vendor. So there's lots of ways and we're working in a number of departments as we already have helping them support them right now. So, so I'll pass it back to Amanda and we'll, uh, uh, we'll have some opportunities for some Q&A, yeah. We can't hear Amanda, so. She might be muted. Having a hard time hearing Amanda. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll read it off here. Oh, there you go. Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so we have one question here um, that I think is really interesting. Government does demonstrate pockets of doing a lot of innovation, even outside of crisis situations. However, Government does not have the reputation of operating um, or implementing that innovation. So what can be done differently post COVID to incorporate some of that inf innovation in the new normal? Hmm. Tough question. Um, I think that'll need to be part of the, the lessons learned exercise because the other the other big challenges is will be to make sure that innovation as appropriate and when appropriate goes across government as opposed to being siloed within within one or two two de departments um, and the innovations also have to be tested and, and verified I mean most public servants will uh, many public servants will have a per have had a personal experience with, with with Phoenix, for example, which is a kind of a dirty word. But um, going going forward, um, you know, you look at the the procedures which have been put in place to evaluate the successor system. So I think um, test test but verify was which was an old um, verify but test um, was an old slogan I think of Ronald Reagan's um, so that will be, be key but I think there also has to be more openness to change and some of that's generational I mean I found that that um, you've got two big two big problems one is is the degree of computer literacy which is common to the millennials that Margaret um, mentioned is sometimes not of great interest. Um, as in, we don't have all oh, have social media profiles and aren't trolling through it. Um, and, and there's also sort of insecurity if you're in a group with people over several several ages or several age groups that you're not keeping up. And the other thing is the cynicism problem because, um, you know, oh, I've seen this. We did this. We did it 10 years ago, and then we did a U-turn, and now we're doing the other thing. Continuity and progress has to be explained because particularly for people who've been in 20 years um, and have seen much come and go um, you have to you know leaders and organizations have to find a way of working around that and not embodying it themselves at the same time yeah it, if i could i think it's important to remember innovation is it's not always a big it doesn't have to be a big change or a big new something i mean innovation is just doing something differently right so it it could be minor little changes so keeping that in mind sometimes you need to take small steps and to bring people along when you're proposing something new it's the same as change management a leadership leader with their team is that you, you can't you know flip that switch right away so it's that uh, one thing to keep in mind the other piece that i find a lot of times we're we're um, we have when there are those great ideas is making sure that we've thought it through in terms of um, what's the business case for this what are the links to other things how how is this going to impact other stakeholders because you say well this is a great idea and our branch is going to do but what about the other branches or what about the public versus internal to government and so on so it's really sort of thinking that through and I still come back to 
don't be looking at the big change. We we have done that kind of thing where we've bitten off way more than we can chew at one time. So I would say try the small steps and, and it's gradual and sometimes they won't even know that it's changed. And next thing you know, we're doing something different. Well, it's kind and, of like the running room principles, right, of, of that 5K. The, what's the gateway drug? It's 5K, it's not a marathon. Right? Yeah, and, exactly. and I think another and then make another piece to that is uh, is and we always talk about thinking outside the box. I always say, no, we need to think actually inside the box. Like we need to actually think in our own box. We need to do some thinking, not just doing. <laughs> right? So, just yeah, ahead, yeah. Building on something that uh, Margaret said a few minutes ago, it's it's asking the questions on the lessons learned, but actually listening to what the answers are and listening to the comments. It, it, you know, you can, uh, people can talk and talk and talk, but if no one's actually paying attention and really absorbing what others are saying, it's really useless. Yeah. Um, well, we have, a, we have some more questions coming in here. Um, I'm going to um, give uh, Todd Newman uh, the floor here, so I'll, I'll unmute you. Hear you. Maybe while we're in that pause, there's a question from Mel Gonway saying, how is HR continu continuity going to be changed by 320 as 9-11 changed many aspects of life? How is the HR community going to be changed by 320 um, as 9-11 changed many lives? And, and what are your thoughts about that? How will, how will this impact the HR community? Um. Well, I mean, there was already a commitment in the um, platform of the Liberal Party before we, they were returned to office to um, reduce the length of time for staffing that it takes to staff positions. So that that may very well, well stay there. Um, I think personally, it's too early to say. I mean, it'll be part of an evolutionary assessment because. We're not completely certain how the new normal will look like and there may be more than one new normals right there may be several several new normals and and then there'll be something else and we'll be looking for a new new type of normal again um what i did appreciate in my own experience and i suspect it's being done again this time my experience with 9 11 which i mentioned at the very beginning was was twofold i mean i was just told you know you you need more people you can do emergency staffing you can get people in here within a week and that was an enormous asset in the immediate wake of 9-11. And I, I'm assuming those flexibilities still exist and have been, been exercised. Um, so I'm not sure there'll be any quick short-term changes. Maybe I'll just go to Susan and then we'll, I'll go to the next question. Susan, any comments about that? Yeah, I like, I like the idea of, I like the idea of um, starting to question how we can do this more efficiently, you know? Uh, because there's a lot there's a lot that we have to go through to make something to to get to staffing and it's we've got to we've got to improve it we've got to improve the speed. Alan, could no, I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, 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 no. this one's near and dear to my heart because I spent 30 years in HR and yes. finished at the right. office human resources officer and, and worked a lot with the community. I think what I really hope is the community looks at this as an opportunity to get even closer to their clients and to the business and to really understand what the impacts are. Uh, they're being uh, leaned on heavily these days because there are a lot of immediate kind of issues around, you know, how do we do work at home and I have performance issues and what do I do? So, yeah, so yeah, there are labor yeah. relations, health and safety issues. But I think it's a real opportunity for the HR community to sort of take a look at their role and how they operate and, and look at where they can bring more value to the, t to the table. Yeah, I was thinking you were saying that, Margaret, that in a way we, I've always sort of said that HR should be like this peer to peer, but often HR is, the executive team, you know, and CFO and CTO, and the HR has sort of been slightly below that. If we're all Absolutely. being fully, fully <laughs> present here today, <laughs> the truth of that, and I, yeah. and I really do think the amount of equity that, that has been built within HR strategy, all the things that they're and their ability to be lean on. So you, we need to be an equal partner. I don't always think that. And that's not just in the public sector, by the way. That's across. We work multiple organizations, right? So we see that as an issue. You know, multiple. You know, we we have 2,300 plus clients across the country in all kinds of sectors, and and I think HR has often been below the bar, and it mm -hmm. not because of skill set, just because of the way it's been. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, go ahead. I think they have somebody again. And by the way, I'm cognizant of time. We're going to stay on for those that want to leave at one, or sorry, two rather. Um, feel free to do that. We're going to stay on or for questions for 15 or 20 more minutes. So, yeah, yeah. But I think Amanda might be unfrozen again. I think you're unfrozen there, Amanda. Yeah. Yeah, all the joys of, of remote working, the uh, computer completely seized. But um, I just wanted to call on, uh, I was just saying, I was calling on Todd Newman. Um, you, are, you are unmuted now if you'd like to ask your question. We'll give you a minute. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, yeah. um, yeah. yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, the question is, is that um, um, with the, uh, I know I've been part of the public service for 23 years plus, um, and I've been home for five weeks uh, because my the line of job that I have with the public service, you can't work at home. Um, and I've been in contact with my um, uh, with my team leader, telling me so when when everybody was when my office was closed, um, everybody was told that if um, if the employees will be here uh, helping other other departments. Um, they'll be contacted. So I was contacted, uh, I, as you might know, that Justin Trudeau uh, um, offered these fundings, these EI premiums, and the employees of my department were going to be working on a project. Um, so I was told that somebody was gonna be calling me. Uh, I never got called, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And now, um, the same week, another another team leader called me and saying that uh, they need uh, there's another project out and somebody's going to be calling me. That was like two weeks ago, and I haven't been called. Um, and so, and I've been reaching out with my team leader, and she says just sit back and wait, and you will be called. But you know, even though I'm still getting salary, um, and uh, so. What should I be doing at the in in this case? It sounds to me, Todd, like you're doing everything right. You know, okay. you're you're available, you're reaching out, you're keeping in touch. Um, you know, like there sometimes the wheels do turn slowly just because you have a lot of moving parts and you're trying to get everybody organized. Um, I think you're doing the right thing. Uh, continue to touch base and say, you know, still available for that project, you know, let me know uh, when the next meeting is. I, I think, that, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a waiting game. And the clerk alluded to that in his message to the public service that, that you know, the project itself may not re be ready for launch just yet. And, and, and it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's not personal in any sense it's just the project's not quite there yet or hasn't got the approvals or the funding or whatever is needed and, and as I said the clerk did say that you know people will be called on and if they're not busy right now they shouldn't fret yeah. um, thanks so much yeah um, we have a, a really great question here um, from Gita Vak um, so in your work as trainers and coaches with employees and executives in government departments what do you see that uh, training participants want most when you meet them, especially in this crisis? What do they want the most? I'm sorry, I just want to be sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so our um, when we meet with clients um, and we're supporting employees in the government, what do you find is the most common uh, need um, when you meet with them? Well, I think um, I'll take a stab at that. A, a lot depends, quite frankly, on where the individual is in their public service career. Um, I've had clients, I'd say roughly three groups. One, those are fairly early in their in their public service career and may, for example, have been bridged in through the, the, the FSHWEP program and are perhaps finding that not so much the department, but the line of work, they want to branch out and they want to explore Know, where they might build their career. So there's that group. Then there's those sort of people who've been in between 15 and 25 years. Um, 
often tend to be very ref reflective and sort of thinking, is this, you know, is this this it? Is this where I want to stay? How much of a push do I want to make? Do I need new skills? Um, should I be doing some, you know, networking becomes very key, particularly if they have aspirations to move into the executive category. And then people in their last 10 years, people very different. Some people are thinking of how they're going to bridge their life after their full-time career in the public service. And as everyone knows now, I mean, an increasing number of the stats are out there. I don't have them at the drop of my ha hand, but um, that most people don't just sort of, you know, quit working and go off and play golf. Um, people move into different activities, sometimes paid, sometimes not paid, sometimes a blend of the two. So people often value, you know, having uh, someone neutral and, and, and a safe place to, to sort of think out loud. A lot of it is thinking out loud, quite frankly, um, because as one client said to me, well, my husband's so sick of hearing me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've come to you instead. Hmm. I think um, I think there's something you were point t touching on that uh, knowledge knowledge uh, is very tough. If if someone is more junior or new in their role, and that's a lot of people uh, in the public service, uh, getting the knowledge, learning, you know, just how to do your job, what do you need to know, what acts, what what policies, etc., is really tough in COVID. That's a that's a really tough challenge. Yeah. And I, what I've been seeing more is on more sort of operational management questions that have come up is managers, leaders and employees really concerned about sort of how they're going to continue to communicate with people. How do they manage this? How do they keep the business going in, in a way that sort of looks uh, like still continues to deal with priorities, keeps regular business going because, you know, everything on COVID, but it doesn't mean that other things stop necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, so their creativity is being challenged and they're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, I spend a fair bit of time with managers who are saying, you know, I've got some, like, how, how do I, how much communication is good? Um, some are going way overboard, like it's too much. So, you know, it's, so how do they adjust their, their style to the needs of their employees? So we spend a lot of time going through that kind of, of work is communicating and keeping that team spirit going, uh, certainly during this crisis. Um, and I think actually, even outside of that, I think that if there wasn't a crisis, that seems to be an issue that uh, a lot of people like to sort of, you know, think out loud and, and talk about, um, how they do it and how how that could be perceived so that's interesting treasury boards uh, input into this saying you know if you have time use it wisely and now's the time to invest in your team if you can and and, and so that's what i think you know there are scenarios that we just heard about a gentleman who's you know if, if he was being over the last few weeks had been getting some training or some online training wow. to help him grow in the season so you need that as an example there's lots of examples of scenarios either it's through demand or through under demand <laughs> right through over demand in the sense of how do i do with that over demand and all the skills i need and under demand i'm not quite as that utilized as i could so how do i invest in my team and so that's what's really great about us being on a qualified and approved a partner with apex and then the different solutions we have that can be customized for individuals and teams and we've left some information for jason there so yes yeah. we'll go back to amanda yeah, yeah absolutely um okay so we'll we'll look at uh, our next question here um from uh um so during the return to normal operations what is your practical advice to managers when uh, some of their employees will refuse to work in the regular offices because of their anxiety related to getting infected with covid covid19 by other employees that was a long one just let me know if you need any of it repeated yeah. Uh, can I, I'll, I'll dive in here. I think it, it, yeah. be, there will be definitely some guidance that will be provided from central agencies in terms of that return, because there are going to be a lot of considerations around health and safety um, and personal safety is going to be paramount. So my, my guess and, and from what I hear is that there's already work underway that says, how do we transition a workforce back? Um, and hopefully some guidance. Yes, some employees will be okay to do that and others will not be so it it that whole gradual move back will probably be the best thing and as managers the best thing you can do is to stay in 
absolutely regular, almost constant communication with your employees. Make sure you know who's where on that continuum. What are their fears? What are they worried about? What are the things that we can do to help support them through that? So you really need to have that trusting relationship. Make sure they know the door is open and that they can raise their concerns with you. If you're if you're not in touch with them and they're hesitant to do that, you could end up with employees who are going to refuse and you won't you won't see it coming. So so the more you communicate, the better that's going to be. I think that I think just to build on that is is acknowledging acknowledging the fears, acknowledging where mm -hmm. everyone is, and and making sure that they see that that uh, that you hear what the employees are saying. But then it's showing how those 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 things have been addressed. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I don't think the return to work um, a it'll be a graduated and gradual, and it'll happen in sync with the return to other things like being able to do more shopping, being able to get kids, being able to go to school. So it's it's going to have to be the approach is going to have to be across society, opening up the borders, for example, being another an, an, another big big issue. Um, because if the virus is out there, it's out in multiple places um, as, aside from the work environment. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Um, Maureen here has a has a question uh, specific, sorry, specifically related to managing change resistant employees. So how do you engage an already change resistant employee? So her concern is just that um, these, this type of employee um, kind of may start to quote unquote contaminate the team construct in what is already a very sensitive environment. So how do you approach that situation? It's a good question where some people would actually use this environment as a wedge as another way to amplify or wedge, right? So they would take mm -hmm. this opportunity and strategically, not necessarily because of that, right? But strategically leverage it, um, right? That's really what she's saying. Mm -hmm. I think I think like all change, we have to be able to show as leaders, we have to be able to show the the reason why, like you know, and what's in it for the employees. So change resistance is often fear, um, it's feeling overwhelmed, um, you know, it's sadness, it's it's actually grieving what we used to have. And so you have to be able to show what's in it for the employees. And so really a lot of that is going to be around, you know, building the case for why we're doing this change. It isn't just because we want to change, right? I mean, that's, so managers have really got to have their story straight so they can um, share that with mm -hmm. the employees. Yeah, I, I think there's building on that. What Susan was saying is that um, another thing managers can do is to make sure that when they're looking at how that transition is going to happen is that you engage those employees actively in pieces of that so yeah. that you're consulting with them, you're hearing them, but you are actually taking some of their suggestions, like empower your team to say, this is what we'd like this to look like and, and let some, some on the team lead that. Uh, sometimes that means that they they're contributing but that they will own the end solution and then that way you know that their needs have been incorporated and hopefully they'll see that their needs have been met in some fashion so um, there's never a perfect or easy answer to this but the, the more you keep that communication and that door open and the more I think Susan said it earlier is that if they know that you're listening and they see that like acknowledgement coming that that may help to sort of slowly bring them around I like that idea of getting the entire team as well excited about where we're heading in the return. So there's in a sense of pr protecting the rest of the team, saying you have, you know, it's the group think, right? If more of the group is yes. looking forward to getting back and organizing, then that person has less opportunity in a way. You want to use that social distancing idea, <laughs> right? You want to social distance them <laughs> by creating some distance to the rest of the team in a way by by their thinking right and uh, mm -hmm. by getting the team so it's 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 tough and I, I think sometimes just having direct conversations like just uh, calling a spade a spade these are adults right you're an adult they're an adult I think sometimes a direct conversation just to call somebody on it sometimes that's all they need they need to be held accountable and, and called on it right and uh, um, it's this isn't this isn't an environment isn't an excuse to be immature or disrespectful that's not that's not what this environment allows you to be. Right? Uh, you know, you can disagree, but you can't be immature or disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have 
I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say it's probably a good question to maybe wrap up on because it's, it's probably going to stimulate a lot of conversation here. It's a big one. Um, so uh, how is HR continuity going to be changed? Um, and I, I find it interesting how they labeled um, calling this uh, 320, so changed by COVID-19, as 9-11 uh, changed many aspects of life. So drawing this, uh, the, the similarity, as you guys did back from the beginning of the panel, um, so how do you find, how do you expect the HR continuity is really going to be changed by this and in, in comparing it to how it changed, uh, 9-11 changed many aspects? Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in here. Uh, I think any of those kinds of major changes or those kinds of events are going to have an impact on, on the way business is done. Um, I think if we talk about HR continuity, I think I'm, I'm assuming it's sort of the business of HR is what somebody is talking about. It's a little unclear, but, um, and I think it's looking at where the organizations are going now, what kind of changes are happening and what will be the new or the new normal, whatever it is, where, where is that, what direction is that going in and what do we need to do to support people to get through that? So I think, if we can if we can focus on that there are already a lot of tools available there's a lot of things out there so we're not drastically going to necessarily change the way we're staffing but i go back to the example i think Lillian, you talked about is the person who said you know do it on a saturday because so so those kinds of minor modifications to how that how how we are supporting the business um and people management i think, I think if, oh sorry uh, sorry Lillian. I I was just going to say that, um, you know, we didn't see all the impacts from 9-11 on our business or on how we did things in government and even outside of government. We didn't see all the impacts until time had passed. I think how I would lay groundwork would be to prepare the staff and prepare everyone for the fact that there will be change and that there will be some modifications to what we do and how we do it. And I think that's really is just to sow the seeds of openness. Yeah, because we even, didn't the nine, even the 9-11 idea. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Lillian. Yeah. yeah. I was just, I mean, if you look back at uh, the public service post 9-11, I mean, certain areas became um, high demand. So, for example, intelligence analysts were looking at issues like potential terrorist threat. Um, so it, it's a fluid thing, right? And even before COVID, look at the growth and demand for people with cybersecurity expertise. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if, and I don't know much about the internal workings of PHAT, but there were to be an in increase in, in need um, and demand for people with scientific backgrounds, re researches, et cetera. So, so these are all things which will be, be looked at in, you know, in, in the post-immediate post crisis. So because the, you know, the public service as a whole has to adjust to the needs of the government and the needs of the Canadian people, right? Mm -hmm. So, so making well, very basic issue, for example. I mean, there's already beginning to be some discussion on um, stocking up adequate domestic supplies and how do we approach emergency stocking, for example, of, of personal protective equipment. So you could you could easily spend you know 15 minutes drawing up a nice long list of things which are going to have to be thought of. And which are going to have to be done um, or overseen in one capacity or another um, by the public service. Food inspections, ensuring that you know uh, food food security and that food gets to where it's supposed to go to, um, preventing transmission in workplaces, etc. There's a whole gamut of issues which will require not only the scientific or technical expertise, but also the people who can communicate it, who can manage the budgets, who can staff the people. So the the, the spectrum will be there. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking that, you know, it's interesting, we we sort of um, forget, uh, like everyone keeps on thought, well, well, what's going to happen next? So, so part of it will, sometimes the, renov the lack of innovation or the resistance of what's going to happen next in HR can be, well, what will what would happen if we go back to where we were, <laughs> right? We get another wave of this. And and I was thinking about that. Susan and I were chatting about this yesterday about uh, after 9-11 that there was a lot of fear, if people remember, for a, one to two years after that of like, what if it, a dirty bomb happens? What if, right? There's a lot of what ifs. It wasn't the end of something. It wasn't like we've gotten the enemy and it's it's solved, right? Um, just like 9-11, it didn't solve quote, quote, the enemy. It, it was very much a new risk that we hadn't 
seen it as a new way of risking all of our lives in different ways. And I think, you know, just just like this now, that there are new risks. And but we the need to say thing that we are very resilient as a as a nation. There'll be lots of things that kick in that will help us de-risk this so that we can move forward. Lillian, you're going to share something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say that when looking back at 9-11 again, I mean, the Department of Public Safety, CBSA, these are all creatures of, um, and, and you know, of, of the post 9-11 environment. The enhanced security at, at mm -hmm. uh, airports, CATSA, for example, um, these are, mm -hmm. these were all things which really came on stream after 9-11. And something similar will happen, you know, in this case. Absolutely. Again. Yeah. And we'll have some sort of, that's I think we'll have some sort of a health ID system that will be tracking or monitoring in a good way, not everyone's, and that will enable us. So that's why I'm confident about the, that it's, it's, it, you know, we, we really have this kind of black and white, the world was great before and it's going to be, who knows what's going to happen next, right? <laughs> to know yeah. the world was what the world was. And we just went through this very, very, very unusual set of circumstances. But our ability for the, for us as individuals, but also for the public service to, to be innovators, to be to be smart about these things, and quite frankly, implement things very, very quickly. We saw post 9/11, post 2008, all kinds of good examples of how the public service came alongside with private sector, with the, with the, you know, with the um, political, you know, machine, and came together really quickly to enable us to move forward as a nation. And that's one thing I'm really holding on to. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we're going to, to wrap up the questions there. Um, thank you, Lillian, so much. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Susan. Um, and, and Alan, of course, thank you for, for hosting and moderating. Um, so uh, I want to thank all of you attendees uh, who joined us today. Uh, big thank you to you, especially as you are in the thick of it every single day. Um, uh, surveying us. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you're doing and all of the work, uh, of course, that you're putting in um, during this crisis. Um, so thank you so much. Um, as a quick reminder, um, you can access the uh, handouts um, as well. So don't forget to, to quickly download those if you haven't done so already. Um, and we will be, I know a number of you, um, we've had so many questions. A uh, number of you haven't had all of your questions answered, but we will be uh, following up with every um, attendee today. Um, we'll be sending out an email, and so we do welcome absolutely uh, uh, questions that way too. Um, and we'll be able to start the question, uh, sorry, start the conversation with you offline. Um, and finally, I know a lot of you as well. Obviously, you're you're joining us um, because of your your interest in this topic and um, looking for support to to be able to lead and guide your team through this time and uh, be able to to you know, really um, guide them through uh, this time of change. So, um, of course, we're here, um, Joy, we have a number of um, expert coaches, um, facilitators to really support you in that. So as well, um, like I said, we'll be following up with an email. We'll be able to start the conversation to how we can uh, support you and your team specifically in your unique situation. So thank you again, and uh, we'll leave that there. And we look forward to, to chatting with all of you offline. Thanks, Lena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.